Hello, everyone. I am so thrilled to be here the, today with Erin. Um, she is just a ball of energy and a ton of fun. Erin, tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for having me here today. Um, I am a former educator, but currently I am the founder and executive director of Undo Mindset. Um, I spent 15 years in the classroom and actually ended my educational career in a school shooting. Um, it was gang related, no fatalities. One student was shot, um, <clears throat> but you know, it was super traumatic. So I checked myself after that happened. I checked myself into a mental health facility where I learned really amazing skills and tools. Um, and just recognize a couple of things in that experience. One is that we are absolutely not teaching this in our schools and we should be. Um, two is that, you know, mental health is truly a privilege and, and we do it in such a proactive, I mean, reactive, excuse me, reactive way right. in our country. So it's a privilege and it's after the fact. Um, you know, I had to be an adult in crisis, have insurance and $1,600 cash. Um, I don't think that that is how our mental health systems should work in our country. Uh, so we are on a mission to really change that and make our uh, curriculum, which is a computer based curriculum, um, equitable and accessible and really get it out there to marginalized communities, communities that haven't otherwise had the financial means to potentially access some of these resources. Um, we are a fairly new nonprofit, but we are also a huge nonprofit in that we have Oh my gosh, I think over 110 volunteers are working on this project wow. now. So, yeah. How long ago did this start? Well, we only just became a nonprofit about two months ago, not even. Oh, congratulations. Um, thank you. But we started, uh, you know, kind of gathering board members about a year ago. It's been okay. about a year that we've been really working on this project. And yeah, we have uh, people coast to coast, internationally. I mean, in a world that feels like it is on fire, it's a really beautiful thing to see all these people come together to try to be part of a solution yeah. and, and really, you know, fix this narrative. What an incredible movement that yeah. you, you know, started. You know, I love that you said movement. My marketing director said that to me last week. Oh, look at that. And she said, Erin, I don't know if you were meaning to start a movement, but I think you are. And I was like, yeah. I, I mean, it wasn't necessarily my intention, but I am absolutely here for it because it is the right kind of movement that we absolutely need. So, yeah, if we can do it, let's do it. <laughs> you know, one of the things you said that just resonates with me is that we are such a reactive society to mental health. Mm -hmm. And I th think that's one of the biggest reasons we're where we are today. A thousand percent. Mm -hmm. And mean, I even think about it in the smallest nuances of it, right? So like I always come from the educator perspective and mm -hmm. I think about like what are our systems around mental health even for our young kids where it should be proactive because the trauma hasn't really impacted their lives quite yet. Right. And we like, you know, a kid becomes dysregulated. We kind of take them out of the classroom. We do a lot of reactive trying to put a Band-Aid back on it. Um, but we aren't really doing any of the things that we need to to like build them with the tools and skills prior to the hard things so mm -hmm. that when hard things happen, we are able to really navigate them correctly. Um, so. Yeah, I mean, truly, from like the little kids all the way up to our greater world, all of our mental health stuff is really trying to figure out what was our previous trauma and how yeah. did we navigate it and how can we refile that filing, that paper in our filing cabinet of a brain and how can we react or uh, retroactively go back and fix the things. But if we could get skills and tools in our beings prior to right. that, we would come out such in a much better place in a healthier society. Okay, so I'm having a flood of thoughts right now and they're actually conflict <laughs> they're conflicting. So I'm going to say one and then you're going to say yes. are is this uh, you know am I am I does this person have like two personalities because she's going to be coming <laughs> from the complete opposite side. But the first one is is I even look back. I've got a 19 and 21 year old. And now that I'm a lot deeper in all of this, I look back and think, oh my gosh, if I would have known this, if I would have known this, um, and you know, we do the best with what we know at the mm -hmm. time, right? Mm -hmm. But instead of maybe worrying about whether or not I was nursing correctly, it sure would have also been nice, I think, to have a uh, provider at some point be teaching me about young 
you know, child psychology, Mm -hmm. how to, you know, early on Mm -hmm. when they were two and they were having a meltdown, how to help them manage those feelings and learn how what those feelings are i mean we didn't know that well and i and i can speak to that because you know i was an educator prior to having my own children and um it absolutely helped me in so many ways and you know my husband who's not an educator he was you know he could see the benefits of my knowledge and my my experiences and my education and he would oftentimes be like i you know trust you and we'll right you know rely on your opinion for how we solve this and yada, yada, yada. Um, and it's definitely hard for me, I think, sometimes as an educator to look at people who are not educators. I'm like, ah, why are you doing right. that? I know what the outcome of that is. I've seen yeah. that on repeat in my journey. Um, and I have to just constantly remind myself, like, oh, they're just parents doing parenting right. things because they didn't have the privilege of being an educator and learning the research and, you know, understanding the development. So 100 percent. I agree that um, the more we can know in that portion of that journey, the better we are really helping them when when they become teenagers, when it gets really hard. Okay, what's the conflicting view, though? Okay, well, I need to. to Yeah, yeah, sorry. Okay, okay. But the really hard thing is, is worse, at least me, we're so stressed out also as a young parent, not knowing everything. So then all of that is just like this big soup of dysfunction and I'm not going to say I, my kids are you know I think actually I'm just going to brag I think I did a really good job but I look but back I think that stage know, of any any that stage is challenging it is a hot mess of a stage when you have little is. kids and toddlers once they kind of reach like third grade and they become a little more independent yeah it's it's a lot easier for sure yeah. but yeah I agree when your kids are little <clears throat> and it feels really chaotic <clears throat> excuse me, how do you get the capacity and the time and the energy and all this stuff to also do that homework right. when, you know, I think like partnerships, I look at partnerships in that stage of familyhood and they're yeah. always struggling because it's really hard to have the time and space to process your emotions and then voice your emotions and then discuss and resolve and all the things. I mean, it's the yeah. same thing within our own beings as parents. We are so like, um, And it's an emotional journey because you're constantly doubting yourself and trying to pick yourself back up and you're trying to give yourself grace and then you're screwing up and you're trying to learn from your mistakes. And I mean, it's just, it's a journey. And then on top of that, you have the guilt and then you're trying to say, well, I should have done this and I should have learned that. And it's, it's a lot. Yeah. It's a lot, but it's an important stage (laughs) as I'm looking back now. It's so important. Also from the sense of being able to detect things. Mm -hmm. So like I look back now and I say, huh, my daughter was struggling. My daughter was struggling with anxiety early on and she was doing one heck of a job at coping skills at a young age. She was pulling herself away and I never, never just picked up on that until later. Mm -hmm. And I looked back and I was like, oh, this makes sense. Okay. Now my conflicting side. Okay. So it appears that we have mo- mental health is a lot more prevalent these days mm-hmm. whether or not it is i don't know mm-hmm. now 30 years ago 50 years ago nobody was talking about trauma no one was talking about feelings and mm-hmm. none of this mm-hmm. and it didn't appear that there was a mental health crisis so how in the world is it that we just all stuffed our emotions back then? Or what has yes. happened? The answer is yes. These? And okay. <laughs> <laughs> I think that there's a lot to it. Okay. So there's that's a super complex question to answer. I think I that we didn't know a lot about the brain because technological yeah. advancements hadn't caught up with us yet. I think the more we know, the more <clears throat> we can diagnose, right? I right. think the other thing, too, that I am on a mission to do is destigmatize the human experience. I love the verbiage of neurodiversity, and I mm-hmm. love that everybody's kind of like, oh, yeah, I'm neurodivergent. It's just like this blanket name for humanity, in my opinion, because we are right. all neurodivergent. 
Um, I think the other thing that we should also always recognize is that trauma is very much part of the human experience. Like, I don't think there is a single human on this planet that gets to leave and exit this planet without trauma. So I do think that, like, in the earlier days, we're just trying to move away from, like, that narrative of, like, dudes can't have emotions. And, you know, I think even in the, the females world, that narrative trickled into us to where we feel like we are always um, being judged being dramatic or something if we do have emotions. So we're trying to figure out how to stifle our emotions and whatnot. But I think as science progresses, as technology progresses, as we learn more about what it means to be a human in general and how our brains work, we are understanding more and more and we are realizing that this is all just part of being a human. This is how we tick and having emotions is actually um, something we need. I always say it's a human right to have emotions and to understand Mm -hmm. your emotions deeply. It is just like oxygen and food and shelter and all these other things in my opinion. I think it was really, really, really inhumane of us to tell men to not have emotions because to know your emotions and the broad spectrum of your emotions and then how to respond navigate your emotions is something all humans deserve to feel and understand um but you know the other thing i mean i always just say like the three parts of our body that i equate to like the marianas trenches is our brain our guts and our hormones i suspect Mm -hmm. I mean, just in the last decade, we have seen so much progression on the understanding and research around these areas, but I still feel like we just don't know nearly enough about how they all tie together, too. I Um, know. And I think then I'm hopeful the next couple of decades we'll really have a greater understanding of those links. Um, But again, I think that when we think about history of understanding humanity, we're really just getting to the starting point. And so like, yeah, maybe 50 years ago, 30 years ago, 20 years ago, we really weren't paying attention to it that much. But that doesn't mean it didn't exist. Um, It's like I said to my mom during we go to therapy together. And I said to her, I said, just because you refuse to acknowledge that you have mental health stuff going on because you're human, not because I'm shaming her, but like we all do, doesn't mean the rest of us don't have to deal with it. Like you can acknowledge it exists or you can not acknowledge it exists, but we are all still kind of, you know, navigating it, you know, right. and I think it's important that and we it's need it's nothing to... to be ashamed of. No, it's human. Yeah. It's so human. We need to destigmatize the human experience. We all have self-doubt. We all go through these cycles. Um, And the other thing I want to mention, too, just talking about, like, our history, I'm reading a really amazing book right now, um, and it's super informative. I'm going to pull up the title because I would never remember otherwise. It's called The Anxious Generation and How the Great Rewiring of Childhood is Causing an Epidemic of Mental Illness. And it's by Jonathan, I'm not sure if I'm going to pronounce his last name correctly, Hyatt, H-A-I-D-T. But it's a very, very, very recent book published book so it has very very current uh statistical data for us and he um in his data you can see like a huge link between when he and he has charted like when did facebook start and here is our Mm. mental health trends and when did facebook buy instagram and here is the mental health trends when did we go from flip phones to smartphones when did we go from this to that you know and it's so and then also he he looks at it not just even from like a u.s perspective but a global perspective and then he compares like the trends of previous mental health stuff like prior to our this technological um stage that we're in or whatever um and he said you know like some people are saying oh mental health is on the rise because we have so much like historical things happening in our world right now but then Mm -hmm. he looks back on the research of every time we've had historical stuff and he you know they've determined that there is no correlation or causation between historical things and mental health that there can be like some increased anxiety or fluctuation but like over the broader um, timeline of things it doesn't actually put us on the trajectory of mental health issues that we are on currently Um, well going back to your point mm -hmm. which is trauma Mm -hmm. is part of the human experience Mm -hmm. and any major issue we've had throughout I mean, as a matter of fact, we've had probably less than Mm -hmm. so many generations. So we're learning how to deal with that. But but this generation, like, uh, um, 
I don't even know. He called it something else. After Gen Z, he called it something else. But he was like, basically, it doesn't even matter. Because until we can solve, like, we will call Gen Z Gen Z until we are able to figure out how to, like, rope in our technological issues. Mm -hmm. Because they're all going to be in that same bucket of just whatever. And I say this all the time in my work. Um, I say this to my junior board members, which are my our middle schoolers, high schoolers, college age kids I all the time. I love that you have those, by the way. They are my bosses. I adore those those humans. But um, I say to them all the time, like you, they're being raised in a vastly different uh, time frame than anything any previous generation can even try to empathize or support them mm-hmm. in, which is why mm-hmm. I call them my bosses, because ultimately we want to help the next gen. Um, mm-hmm. But, like, I, you know, my husband is a police officer in the town we live in, and um, he always says to me when I do ride-alongs, he's always like, Aaron, do you really want to come? Because once you see something, like, you can't unsee something. Mm-hmm. And I've seen it. I've seen people unalive themselves, and I've seen death, and I'm like, whatever. And I'm not phased by it in the same way because it's not personal to me. And I think that being married to a police officer, you kind of get to this place of, not being immune to it, but like you just see it on a repeated pattern. Right. On the flip side, though, our children are in that same exact place, but they don't have the developed brains because your brain doesn't mm. stop developing until at least 25. They don't have people around them who actually know how to do this work and support them and necessarily like, you know, help them process things. But we right, are giving right. them access to all the world's knowledge. They are seeing other kids like yes. explode in the Ukraine. Once you see it, you can't unsee it. Um, And this is truly the generation of worry because they have so much trauma. And and we have to, at some point as the adult world, like name and identify the traumas that they have experienced in their very small lives so that we can start fixing it. But I don't feel like adults are really like, the kids are screaming about it, but the adults are not paying attention. But like we have the kids are- I wonder if adults even- realize right it was almost like a light uh, uh, you know a light switch just was flipped up right it wasn't that we had this p- gradual progression i mean it may seem like it was a gradual prov- um, progression from myspace to facebook to there Instagram. was actually a switch so the but book it's like that i'm switch, reading right oh good i'm so smart the book that i'm reading <laughs> is talking about there is actually a defined moment when there I was like that. a light switch and what it was was on the internet. Oh, God, I wish I could remember what year this was like past or whatever. But you know, when you go on like the internet, if I want to go on to uh, rhymes with corn but starts with P, I don't know if I can talk about this on your show or not. Yeah, it's fine. We'll mark it. But perfect. Yeah. I, oh yes, um, you can. Please do. I mean, so, not really, but you yes, know what I got mean. it. <laughs> yes. um, so if we have, you know, when you go to those sites. Um, There was a defined date in history when we went from, like, you couldn't access to now you can say, yes, oh, yeah, I'm 18 and above, and I can Mm -hmm. put in my own date. I actually remember when this happened, there was a a a shift where I was like, whoa, now we just have literally unlimited access to the things. And even my son was saying that last night. He was like, oh, I made a LinkedIn profile so I could could follow you, mom, on LinkedIn. (laughs) I said, but... You don't have a job, dude. He's like, oh, yeah, no, I just made it all up. <laughs> like, yeah, that's true. Right? <laughs> don't tell me. Don't tell me. <laughs> but truly, they're doing that to all of the, you know, yeah. not LinkedIn necessarily. And right. and it's interesting. I would be curious to know what that year was because I bet you probably, if I could pull that year up, you'd probably be like, oh, yeah, that yeah. is when my memory, that light switch went off. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. No. And it, it does. So with a light switch right because it's so immediate we we haven't had the opportunity to evaluate it or it doesn't sit present on mm-hmm. you know top of mind so out like out of sight out of mind right and so like when your kids are out there and they're being exposed to maybe not even corn with a p um mm-hmm. they're still being exposed to situations that we never processed as a, mm-hmm. as a kid and we as adults may not look as at as being so traumatic because mm-hmm. we've had 30, 40, 50 years of processing that. Mm-hmm. And um, so I think as parents, back to we do the best with what we know is that maybe this is something that we really, I mean, at 19 and 21, I'm 
I'm past that, but as younger parents, <laughs> is really understanding your kids are being exposed to this. Well, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. It is. Now, I, how do we help them manage it with the little brains that they have? This author talks about um, how this great rewiring of society um, we have seen a shift in parenting mm -hmm. and it's basically like, you know, we as parents, um, what is, God, I wish I could word it the exact same way he did, but basically like we are, um, becoming, you know, more and more of helicopter parents in the real world, but we are becoming more and more disengaged in the reality world. And it needs to be the exact opposite. We need to parent less in the real world and parent more in the reality world. And which is why wow, I always okay, laugh. Okay, repeat that again because that is huge. We, <laughs> yeah, I mean, we have to parent less in the real world. We have to allow our kids to go get hurt. We have to allow our kids to have agency in problem solving and how to navigate all things real world in the real world. We need to parent more in the in the remote world online in understanding what they're watching on YouTube. We're not giving them access to YouTube. Who are they playing with on video games? How are they talking in those video game worlds? Mm -hmm. um, and again, it has to be like the very nuance. It's not even just like, oh, you can't follow Andrew Tate on on YouTube. That's easy parenting. It right. has to be the hard parenting of like, who was that you were just talking to? Do you know their name? Do you know where they live? Do you know how old they are? What were you talking about? Like, really, did you tell them you're home alone? Did you tell them this, that, or the other thing? Like, the nuance of those um, experiences. Because children are basically, at this point, raising each other. Children mm -hmm. are very much turning to their peers instead of their yeah. adults in how to be find that guidance. Um, mm -hmm. And there's another book, I can never remember the title of it for you, that talks about it so deeply. Um, and honestly, after 15 years in the classroom, I could not agree more that parents and adults don't understand their kids. And their, yeah. their lived experience is so vastly different. And we yeah. have to turn the guidance to them. And it feels hard because we're the adults, they're the kids. We don't want them guiding us in this work, but we have to listen to them because they, they know they're way smarter than we ever were at their age, you know? Oh, yeah. And, well, and they're knowing what they need and what guidance they need. And they can tell us. Sorry, so go ahead. Had, no, no, no. We had a therapist on um, on our first season and he basically was talking about how he even parents his adult child now and he was saying that exact thing which was mm -hmm. i don't understand the world that you're in i mm -hmm. try to mm -hmm. but you're living very differently than mm -hmm. i am mm -hmm. talk to me about it and educate me on it mm -hmm second point was we had another guest on who was against it she, she you know she's talking about technology and how severely detrimental it is to our kids and there is a philosophy that you just don't expose your kids to it right you take mm -hmm, it away from mm -hmm. your kids mm -hmm. I see a problem with that in the fact that it's not going away can so, I can I tell you what I just wrote down yes yes <laughs> Age of overexposure, <laughs> because something I talk about all the time, parents come to me a lot for parenting guidance, and I didn't mm -hmm. mean to interrupt you, I'm no, sorry. No, no, please. But between my involvement in the education system and my nonprofit and my husband's work and being in the mental health world, um, when I say a lot, I mean multiple people a day will constantly be like, this is what happened, what do I do? And I constantly come back to this main point of that we are in the age of overexposure and we can't do anything about it. You can mm -hmm. try to shelter your kids, but what's going to happen is that's going to bite you in the butt because your yeah. kids are going to be exposed, period. They're going to be exposed by their peers. They're going to be exposed by other kids. Even if your kids are like isolated in their homes, they will be exposed. There is absolutely no way to not, not like to not have that happen. I believe we are no longer in the a stage of like keeping our kids in these bubbles, but rather mm. we need to pop those bubbles and we need to help them navigate it. We need to, instead of being the keepers of the information ourselves, we need to be the people who are helping them process that information. Right. What exactly. is real versus what is not like my kids, my kids are eight and 12, almost 13. And I am very transparent about them all the time. So again, talking about corn with a P I tell my kids, even at eight and 12, like, if you want to know what this is, 
Yeah. Let's talk about it. I want to talk to you about that. But <clears throat> if I don't talk to you about it, you're still going to figure it out. Like, oh, there's yeah. no way to avoid that. And then you're going to have a really unhealthy relationship with all things. Absolutely. Corn with a P, you know, involves. And and then where are we? Right. We are like yeah. 12 steps behind the curve and where we need to be. Yeah. I would rather be the person that I can have very, you know, I don't want to be friends with my kids, but I want to be friends with my kids. It's a fine line. Like, I want well, you them know, to it's know. Interesting. My daughter will say to me often, she's like, I don't know why I'm sharing this with you. And she's like, <laughs> but, and then she'll share it. And it's not like gossip, but it's like stuff yeah. that, you know, that I am so, I feel so privileged <clears throat> that I can have those mm -hmm. conversations with my kids about because of what you just said. <clears throat> They're well, there's hear people it from who somebody. will shame you for that, though. There oh, are I know. people on this planet who will be like, oh, you just want to be best friends with your kids. No. And it's like, mm -hmm. it's not that, though. Like, it's different than that. Because my kids, if I say no and I give them the look, yep. my kids don't push back. Like, they yeah. know mom means business. And yeah. I am absolutely respected and taken seriously as the authoritarian parent or whatever. Not that I strive to be, but like, I want my kids to come to me if they're unsure what is real versus yep. what is not. I want my kids to come to me before they make stupid decisions like eating Absolutely. Tide Pods because the internet told them that they should do that. <laughs> like, you know. <laughs> well, and I think that is the difference. I don't think that when I see or I think of parents that try to be friends with their kids, mm -hmm. that is somebody That's like trying mean to girls. hang out. Yeah. Mean girls. I'm the cool mom. <laughs> yeah. Yes, exactly. That, that's not that's not it but I want to have real conversations with my kids mm -hmm. and I don't want my kids to be afraid to come and say what is this or I'm thinking about this or in worst case scenario I did this let's talk about it because Here? I'm not going to shame you yeah but you but we need to work through you know what what all this means I love that you use the word shame. I talk about shame a lot. I actually don't feel shame in my life. I personally have done a lot of work around shame because it's not purposeful. And I think right. we live in such a shame-based society. I oh, mean, yeah. shame is literally what is the, you know, the hands on the clock that make us tick at this point as society. Yeah. Um, and I think that previous generations very much relied on shame in order to parent their kiddos. And oh, it's, yeah. we're trying to change that as society. It's slow, but um, I think that, you know, like... <laughs> I, my son recently had his first kiss and he texted me literally four minutes later. And oh I, you. you know, as a mom, I'm like, that to me tells me I am not in a space where my children feel shame to be human, right. you know? Right. And I, that is to me, like, I don't want to, you know, pat my own shoulder, but to me that tells me I am on the right track to yeah. be a guiding light for my children as they mm -hmm. continue to go through the struggles of teenhood and, and life, you know? I want them to know they can always turn to me, even if it's hard stuff about, like, kissing. Like, I, I didn't have that relationship with my parents. Like, when I wanted to shave my legs, I had to be like, to my sister, Kate, I know you're, you have a Kate too, but to my yes, sister Kate, I, I was like, can you get me a razor? I want to just try shaving my <laughs> legs because I was so embarrassed versus now yes. with my like eight year old. I'm like, if you want to shave your legs, I don't care. If you don't want to shave your legs, I don't care. Like, you know, right. let's just be right. open about it. it all. Yeah. Well, you know what? Getting back to the word shame, mm -hmm. that is a big reason we're in a mental health, health crisis mm -hmm. as well, because mm -hmm. historically, yep. It, if you had something going on where you were struggling with some sort of mental health issue or even not not even considered an illness just anxiety for a period mm -hmm. of time you had to, you felt shame about it because it meant something was wrong with you which is like the worst message we are also very people not we all of us because i don't but there's a lot of people who are very intentionally trying to shame people for mental health stuff per our political environment like oh you think that well you must be crazy or meant you need yeah. mental health issues and i think that's a really slippery slope yeah. and i think it's really dangerous and i think it's honestly um degrading because everybody has trauma and without like trauma creates literally differences in our brains so we all have mental health stuff it is what it is and i think that we're just going to make it even more political and polarized if we continue down this road well and i think right now we're in a situation where it's also getting kind of this muddy soup of what mm -hmm. is what is 
a mental health issue mm-hmm. versus what are some natural human responses mm-hmm. to things. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I think that also is very detrimental to kids that are now going through saying, I'm depressed. I have ADHD. Mm-hmm. I have OCD. Uh, all of these things. I don't think like, it has to be dangerous, though. Like, I think it, it can be done in a productive way. I mean, so my daughter, for example, she's she has ADHD and she just recently started medication. Um, and my friend was over and she, my daughter was around and my friend whispered to me, like, how's it going on her medication? And I was like, mm. you don't need to whisper because there's right. nothing wrong with it. Like, no, she I was, was thinking. I was thinking dangerous where there's kids that are not understanding exactly like they're like all of a sudden they've got anxiety and you and Mm. I both know there is clinical anxiety where you're you're taking medication and you're taking, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um, you know, you're going to therapy and you're really trying to work on it because it's something that's happening, uh, you know, physiologically to you versus the anxiety of. Oh I gosh. get what you're saying. That's mm-hmm. where I'm saying it's dangerous mm-hmm. because there's got to be some framework and education to kids about mm-hmm. like, yep, that's that's anxiety too, but it's not out of control. That's just 100%. normal anxiety. A hundred percent. And I think that we're seeing this muddling of verbiage period, like these extreme ideologies. We have yeah. like, I don't know, because we have no expertise anymore in society. Like all expertise has been thrown out the door because... Well, podcasting to everybody has a voice to you can find other people with similar opinions now to all yeah. the things and so like you know you think about um i don't know both sides of the political spectrum are like you're a bigot you're a bigot and it's like but there's actually a clearly defined definition but now <laughs> we're just like throwing it everywhere that it just feels like now there's no meaning behind any of the words exactly yeah um but yeah absolutely there was something else i was going to say about what you were saying before and i lost my train of thought it's probably because I interrupted. <laughs> it's probably because I have ADHD. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay, too. That's fine. But I do think that the very positive thing about all of this is that we're talking about it. 100%. And we are so, I mean, we are so much more educated in it today than even 20 years mm-hmm. ago when I had my kids. And mm-hmm. I feel so hopeful. And I just think that what we're seeing is kind of this place of where, you know, what direction do we need to be going? And people like you are now also trying to bring it to the masses, Mm -hmm. right? I mean, I think you and I talked about how I feel so fortunate that I was able to take the time and had the resources to be able to focus on my Mm -hmm. kids when they struggled. Mm -hmm. And there's so many that don't have that opportunity Mm -hmm. And where do they go? What do they do? Tell us a little bit about what you're doing with Undo and um, trying to bring it to the schools. What 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 does it look like? I I just want to speak really quickly. Okay, go for it. I think with what you were saying before, bringing this conversation to a greater scale is really going to be the best thing we can do to combat that shame. You know, is Mm -hmm. to really change that narrative. People who were feeling shame, you know, the kids, (laughs) younger kids, they're very quick to be like, oh yeah, that's my ADHD. And like, they're so like flippant about it because they've been destigmatized and they don't see anything wrong with it. Um, And so I do think like the progression is slow. Um, I myself am like, I thought we were all understanding this stuff. So the lack of progression now feels sometimes a little jarring. But I do think that as society, we are slowly progressing in the right direction and we are understanding that mental health is super important not just for our he- you know our brains and our our headspace but for our whole bodies it's connected right. and it's so relevant we cannot be healthy human beings if we are not mentally taking care of ourselves okay thank you for asking me about undo <laughs> well i'm so ex- I'm, i was just when i was reading about it that's why i reached out to you i thought wow this is a woman I need to get to know. And then, of course, when I talked to you and found out your love for Diet Coke and all of the other things, <laughs> I was like, absolutely is a woman I need to know. <laughs> um, yeah, so we have quite a few initiatives that we're working on. Um, we have, like I said, our junior board. Our junior board is doing amazing work, and uh, they feed 175 transient folks every week here in the Denver metro area. 
Um, and they're working currently on a system to bring, again, our curriculum is online. So bringing our curriculum to our K-12, I mean, I'm sorry, to our transient population here um, in the Denver metro area in a way that is free, accessible, and equitable. And then kind of copying, pasting that all over, not just the um, country, but we have junior board members in other countries. Um, so, and I've promised them we will also help their communities as well. Um, in, in addition to that, we have recognized that a lot of transient folks have cell phones, but they don't necessarily have internet access. So we are working on um, creating a committee of folks. So if anybody's listening and wants to join us in this work, we're trying to gather people to uh, try to get our curriculum on every single library computer in our country mm -hmm. free of charge, because we know that people who are usually using those computers are people who don't have the financial means to necessarily access mental health resources. Um, we have a men's group where we really talk about destigmatizing all things male emotional Amen. needs. Um, like I said before, what we've done as a society uh, is awful. And I think that, you know, I wrote down earlier men in shame. Um, mm -hmm. I think it's important when we address this male challenge that we're seeing in society that we recognize it's not their fault. Um, yes. I think that when we shame people, and I think men have felt a lot of shame because for a very long time, for decades, because they're either too manly or they're not manly enough. They're, you know, there's always somebody who's blaming them for this shooting yes. and this school shooting and yada, 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 yada. And you guys, you know, especially white men, you guys did slavery back in the day. And so that's your fault. And they're like, I didn't do any of these things. Mm -hmm. And I think that the male uh, society, the community is feeling maybe insecure and maybe yeah. um, like almost like a corner dog, right? Like yeah. if you corner me and blame me for all the things, I'm gonna bite back and bark, right? Um, and I think it's super important for society to not necessarily blame them, educate them and help right. them understand how to navigate and shift so we can get into a healthier headspace. Um, but our men's group is really uh, a bunch of dudes who talk about like you know how do we make sure that men are in our society are doing that external work but also doing the internal work um we let's see we like i said before my goal is always and will always be to get into our k-12s free of charge um, we want to be accessible not just to our kiddos but also their home support networks we want right. to give it to them free of charge because like i said we all need to play catch up and bubble wrap our kiddos in this work um, and then our educators as well I think there's a lot of educators in our society that don't truly understand trauma themselves. And so they're not necessarily supporting our trauma kids in a way that is, you know, scientifically um, backed. We have a vision of being able to get into our higher education system. So like a freshman year required course, we are working on becoming government contractors so that we can support our active duty and vets in this way. We have a partnership with an addiction recovery center, but we would love to expand that work to make sure we're accessible to all folks uh, doing that really incredible work. Um, we have a pre postpartum mom and dads group, um, mom and dads, because you know, that journey of trying to get ready for bringing a human into your life to then bringing a human into your life is really jarring for all people. Um, I don't think any partnerships are really solid in those stages because it's hard to communicate and really problem solve and do any of that work. So we wanna make sure that we're helping and supporting that community during that transition. Um, we are working on a partnership with a place that is incarcerating children at 12. Um, they are, I know, right? My son's almost 13. I'm like, I can't even process I almost that. have tears in my eyes because I can't I know. imagine. I have chills. Every time I say that, I get chills. Yes. It's ridiculous. They're, they're babies. 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 Um, but they're incarcerating 12-year-olds. So that is our first incarceration location that we are trying to get into. But we um, are looking to be accessible to... Um, you know, all of our prisons and jail systems in our country. And last but not least, I promise I'm almost done with all of our initiatives. Um, but like I said before, my husband is a police officer here. Um, and he actually, about two weeks ago, uh, watched a man unalive himself. Um, and he has been struggling really hard since then. Um, and so I woke up the next day and said, you know what? I'm the boss of this. We're going to start with first responders because Amen. it was supposed to be phase two or phase three. Um, but, you know, uh, normal humans, they say, experience trauma about four to eight times in their lives. First responders is 300 to 800 times in their lives. So Jeez. if they're enduring trauma every day, we need to be doing something else because we literally as a society have just 
not. <laughs> so that's well, what we're on a this. journey to do. <laughs> okay, first of all, I don't know how you sleep at night. That is a I lot. <laughs> and I love it all. I, I, I think there is a place for a volunteer in, in any aspect of that. I mean, if well, you've got you know, any interest of volunteering, that would be... If you are interested in getting resources, mental health resources out to anyone, reach out because we have literally, um, not that you should put humanity into buckets, but we've identified like 8,000 different buckets of humanity that we haven't supported in this way that we probably should. Um, Mm -hmm. And so we truly have a vision of being able to get out there in every single single market and infiltrate every single system that hasn't otherwise integrated this type of work. Um, So even if these, these are our core initiatives that we're working on now in phase one of our development phase but <laughs> in we have several phases mm-hmm. but you know in the next three to five years ideally we would love for it to be completely opened to every person no matter your trauma no matter your lived experience we want to mm-hmm. make sure that you are getting your needs met through our online curriculum you know we're we're a podcast about parenting children or caregiving mm-hmm. children that um, have mental health conditions what I heard from you though, even every single bucket that you had trickles down to the kids, 100%. whether it's the well, educators or the, the first responders, most of them are parents, the educator, they're a parent and they're touching your own kid. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, there's just, it mm-hmm. all trickles down. I also, I also think that it's important. Um, my, I don't even know what her actual position is called. We call her the, the nonprofit doctor. Um, but she's basically, you know, if our, our nonprofit is a living, breathing entity, she's making sure that it stays alive and healthy and can grow up from this baby to toddlerhood to so on. Um, I was telling, she was like, Erin, what initiative is like, if nothing else happened but this, hmm. what is your uh, initiative? I said, well, that's easy. It's K-12s. And she was like, because you're an educator. I said, no, because that is proactive. Right. Everything else is reactive. And that is what is wrong with our system is that we continue to try to put band-aids on things after the fact. And, and, and this is literally like our health system to our government system, to our police system, to our education. I mean, like literally that's just how we function in society in our country. And we want to change that. And the only way we're going to change that is if we actually get out to the kids. We have to be accessible to our K-12 kids if we want to be reactive. I mean, pro, oh my God, I always do that. If you want to be proactive instead of reactive, that is literally the only way we can, and equitable, right? Like I can try to market to every single bucket, but if we can get into every K-12, then we know every kid in the next gen will get the skills and tools they need to make sure that when trauma happens, they are more equipped and ready to actually handle it in a way where they don't have to later in life Life, take that paper out of that filing cabinet and try to you know fix the paper and shuffle it back into the right place like I had to do right right good for you I am so impressed and I thank am excited you. to see where this ends up going because thank it's you just, me too it, it, you've thought about it correctly you really have. I hope, I hope we're you. able to break generational trauma generational cycles um, really, you know, it's, it's hard for me to hand this planet off to my children. So I can't fix it all, but I'm hoping this does a drop in the bucket for us in some way. Yeah. 